It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, who has been with us before, and will ensure that this will be quite an interesting talk. Mr. Christopher Hume is no stranger to the city of Toronto. He was born in England, came to Toronto as a child, and has spent his career writing on issues of architecture and urban affairs. Christopher is someone who has received countless awards and recognition for his journalism and writing. Most notably, he was awarded the very prestigious National Newspaper Award. Mr. Hume understands the city of Toronto. He's an expert in architecture and the history behind our city's buildings and the many stories behind those buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Hume. And now for our guest speaker. Great children are the product of even greater parents. David Mervish is someone who is fortunate to be raised by two great and patriotic Canadian, uh, Canadian parents. First of all, on behalf of everyone, Mr. Mervish, please accept our most sincere condolences on the recent loss of your mother, Anne. The Empire Club has rarely had the opportunity to have a father-son speakers join a place in our iconic Red Books. I'm not sure of too many. I know that there's been Pierre Trudeau and his son Justin recently, and then I know of the Queen Mother and her son-in-law, Prince Philip. And in 1981 and in 1989, David Mervish's father, Honest Ed Mervish, addressed the club. This is the kind of guy he was. One of the speeches was titled, How I Became an Overnight Success Story in 75 Years. <laughs> David Mervish has the genetic of a true patriot Canadian entrepreneur. Mr. Mervish is someone that thinks big, real big. The Mervish family has been a pillar of the arts and culture and entertainment uh, in our great city for several decades. More recently, David Mervish teamed up with the world-famous architect Frank Geary. They've proposed a monumental transformation of our city with two 80-story residential towers described by Mr. Mervish as sculptures that people can live in. What would Toronto be without our CN Tower? I'm sure there are many people opposed to that structure when it was built almost 40 years ago. But it's a building that defines our city. It's the one thing you look for when you're flying back home and you look out the window to know that you've arrived back home. Our buildings define our cultural identity. They boldly and quietly influence the enjoyment of urban life. They tell a story of the kind of people we are. The people of Toronto are creative, diverse, imaginative, and intelligent. Our buildings leave a cultural legacy to generations of citizens and visitors who come to live, work, and play in our growing metropolis. David Mervish is president of Mervish Enterprises, which include Mervish Productions, Ticket King, the Mervish Theatres, which are the Royal Alex, the Princess of Wales, the Ed Mervish Theatre, and the Panasonic Theatre. And the iconic retail emporium, Honest Ed's, named after his father, which is celebrating its 65th year. Mr. Mervish is a member of the Order of Canada and joining his family in celebrating 50 years of presenting and producing live theatre, both locally and internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. David Mervish. David, David. That's good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Um, I, I'm, I'm here just to ask the questions. I know you're here to listen to the answers, and I'm going to try to act as normally as I can. And I can assure you, I didn't write a word about Ian Troop. Um, and he walked here today, so we don't have to worry about a 91 cent claim. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ian. Uh, 
the fact that this event is sold out and that there was a demand for any number of uh, additional tickets, I think is an indication that this is a very uh, unusual, even unique project. And I think that it's important to keep in mind before we start that David is not a developer um, in the traditional sense of the word. Um, this is not uh, uh, just another condo, which is why I'm so interested in this project. And I've been writing about condos for more years than I care to remember. Um, but I've never seen a project like this. It hasn't been built yet, of course. But I do believe quite sincerely that it's something that we as a city uh, have to embrace and take a serious look at. Um, and I'm going to, we're going to talk about that more in a while. Um, David wants to start uh, with some images of stuff that Frank Geary has uh, designed and built around the world. And of course, he's worked here in Toronto too. You all know about the Art Gallery of Ontario which he renovated and transformed into the, to the building it is now. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that this would be Frank Geary's first and only freestanding structure here in Toronto. And don't forget that Frank Geary was born and raised in this city. And I think that this makes the project unique and I think it makes it important and I think it makes it more than a condo, and um, I hope that in, over the course of the next half hour, you'll be able to uh, find out what I'm talking about, and I hope agree with me. I know not everybody does, uh, unfortunately. So first of all, let's, let's get some pictures up here. Um, oh, I'm supposed to do that, sorry. <laughs> um, David, why don't you take us through this? Okay, well, we, we started out uh, with very different images than this, and uh, we had deep discussion with uh, the city planners who eventually said, would we evoke warehouse? And uh, we have warehouse buildings in this neighborhood, and we'll come to talk about that later. But after five or six attempts, I turned to Frank and I said, let's give up. We can't do it. And he said, no, no, I'm into this. I want to do one more shot at it. And so he came up with this building. And when you see this building in close-up shots at the end of what we're showing you, you'll see how he did evoke warehouse and uh, how the part where you as a public using the street will be aware of its past history. So these are pictures of, of other projects as early as 1995. Uh, this. Uh, building in, in Prague, uh, which some people refer to as Fred and Ginger. And uh, it surprised people, uh, but it's a, a residential building fitting in with older buildings and meant to do that. Uh, a sort of made in Toronto solution. And uh, this is the building that I think drew everyone's attention to Frank in some ways, Bilbao, Spain, because Bilbao as a city uh, reminded me, I think before this, of Hamilton, and this transformed the city, and in many ways, and you might want to address that a little well, bit. Well, in fact, uh, Bilbao is the Hamilton of Spain, population half a million, uh, shipbuilding city, a uh, steel town on the Atlantic coast. It lost something like 125,000 jobs over a course of two or three years had hit rock bottom. And the interesting thing about Bilbao is that the various levels of government there, unlike the various levels of government here, decided that they would renew themselves, reinvent themselves through the power of architecture. And this, was the most, this is the most celebrated example of what they did. They also got Norman Foster to design the subway stations. Um, and Bilbao went from being um, a city that nobody had ever heard of to, to one of the 20 most visited cities in Europe. And the, the effect of the building was so, so enormous that it's called the Bilbao effect. So ever since, of course, cities everywhere else have been trying to copy this example. Um, nobody has managed to match it yet but it's still something that, that people are trying, cities are trying to do. And, and I think that, again, this is, you know, this is something that, that, that we have to keep in mind when we look at a project like the King Street one. Um, a, a lesser known um, Geary project in, in Germany. 
the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. This was actually designed before Bill Bow, but built afterwards. Um, you can see this is, this is, these are the buildings that made uh, Frank Gehry uh, the, the superstar architect of his generation. And I, I would just add here that Frank Gehry is 84 years old. Um, something to also to keep in mind. This is our own AGO. Um, this is the project where Frank Gehry reminded us that it's not always about being spect about spectacle, um, but about the simple things of how you get in, how you move around, and creating a space where you can have an experience of art. Uh, his intervention wasn't his intervention was restrained, but has had an enormous effect on on, on the 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 art gallery of Ontario. The Serpentine uh, in London, this is part of a tradition that goes back how many years? I don't know. 10 now, 15? And, and what is interesting about this pavilion, because these are, are uh, put up only for the summer and then they're taken away, is it speaks to Frank's love of materials and of wood. And uh, I think that very sensitive to that and something that uh, uh, is of interest to both him and me. Las Vegas, Nevada, not the kind of place where you expect to find uh, serious architecture, um, um, but this is one of the few non-kitched pieces uh, in that city. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know this project. This, this is uh, for Michael Tilson Thomas and, uh, to uh, Thompson, uh, Thompson, and uh, it's a music center, but you can hear the concerts inside outside on the lawn. So this is a picture in the evening outside on the lawn. But it's an extraordinary music hall where it can be altered uh, to take any size of an orchestra or any small group. And it's, it's where people go from Juilliard as the transition between there and the great orchestras of the world. Ah. This, uh, this is the most recent uh, uh, high-rise condo in New York, uh, already a landmark, uh, visible uh, from the High Line, which is sort of seems to have been built as a place to view this very building. And like so many Geary buildings, it changes as the light changes. There's nobody who is better able to incorporate a sense of motion and movement into his architecture as, as does Frank Geary. Again, uh, we would be uh, the beneficiaries of a lifetime of experience. And uh, the fact that this is his hometown, the fact that uh, this is a unique opportunity uh, is something that, that I think is very exciting. Some more views of the same uh, tower, which I think won an award last year for the best uh, new uh, skyscraper in, in uh, America. Ours would be much better. <laughs> much more interesting. There's uh, a very unique site in Hong Kong of, of a series of, I think, 12 stories of apartment, uh, apartments, each one a full floor. And someone had just had this extraordinary place where there is no land, and yet there is on this one hillside. And so there's a residential building also um, sold out. Well, people want it to be there. And by Hong Kong standards, not very tall at all. No, but quite spacious uh, because 6,500 square foot apartments, they sold for $65 million. We don't have that same market. <laughs> this is, I think, the most exciting part of it because this is Paris and this is the Bois de Bologna. And this is uh, the foundation for creation. Uh, and it's been nicknamed the cloud and uh, uh, Jean Nouvel said, the history of Paris is in its buildings. And once this building is open, it will become a part of us and will be uh, known and make Paris better known than even today, to, to paraphrase him. The building uh, opens next year with a whole year of celebrations. And it's essentially a museum for the Louis Vuitton Foundation. Uh, it will show contemporary art, but it will also show de uh, design and products. And it was meant to make Paris the center of a creative activity and, and focus 
on creation around the world, but also focus on French culture. I think that's it for the slides. Oh, no, we've got one more here. Yeah. Abu Dhabi yet to come. And then I think beyond that is us. Is that? Do you want to hold that? Or new well, quote? let's just hang on here for a second, because I think that before yes. we get into the actual project, we should set the stage. And it begins in 1963, when your father, Honest Ed, bought the Royal Alex on King Street. Yes, and, and the, the Royal Alex, so we've been there now 50 years. We've put on 500 or so plays. We're deeply, our, my real business is live theater, and I have four theaters in the city now. And my father, when he bought it, really knew very little about theater. My mother went, but he didn't really have the time. He went to Honest Ed's, and, and uh, he had been to a show with me the year before. Um, but he renovated it because he thought it was a beautiful building. What he didn't realize was the greater sweep of history that was involved in the neighborhood. In the 1870s, the corner of King Street and Simcoe was once what we today call the public realm, a place where people went in and out of buildings. So the northwest corner was education, it was Upper Canada College, the southwest was legislation, it was the provincial legislature, the southeast corner was uh, um, education, legislation. Uh, damnation. Da no, the, the one before damnation. <laughs> oh. uh, salvation. Salvation. And St. Andrew's Church is still there and is the only thing that actually has survived. And then to the northeast was damnation. That's where the tavern and the... And the, and, and the, and the but all those places were about people going in and out. This is the 1870s. And then in 1907, the Royal Alex is built, which is also a part of the public realm, and the Lexington Hotel, where TIFF is today. In 1912, the railroads bought legislation, the whole south side of King Street, in front of the Royal Alex and in front of TIFF, where uh, Metro Hall is today. And Roy Thompson Hall. And Roy Thompson Hall. And they stored train tr trains there. They, these were the stockyards. This was the end of the track. And they began to build all of these warehouse buildings in the neighborhood. So from 1912 to 1963, this was taken away from the public and made into these warehouse buildings, where people went in at the beginning of the day and out at the end of the day, where it wasn't inviting because it was raised up and you had to go up steps or go downstairs, and they had little windows to let you see some daylight if you worked in the basement. My father didn't know better. He, opened, he bought a theater. It was supposed to be turned into a parking lot. Torn it, down to make way for a parking lot. Yeah, the, the, the city had moved on and was moving to the east. We had built O'Keeffe Center, and that was to take over for the theaters. And my father was a shopkeeper. He didn't know that you're supposed to keep your store your theater closed if you don't have a really great show. He thought it was a habit to go to the theater. So he was open 50 weeks out of 52 a year. And at one point he was so desperate, the show was so bad, it was called Return to the Mountain. He said, look, I'm not even going to charge you, just there's a bucket in the way out. <laughs> Throw what you want in, okay? And, and so from 1963 to now, we drew, in the, when the theater was by itself, 10 to 12,000 people in the wrong direction every week. And the result of that was he wanted to make it easy for people, so he bought the warehouse next door, and he didn't know how to cook, so he went to friends like Harry Barbarian, and he said, what do I make for these people? And he said, make them roast beef. You can work all day at it, and you just have to slice it when they come in. And, and he bought all the peas on a farm, and he put that with it, and he was all set. And he served at its peak uh, 6,000 roast beef dinners on a Saturday night, which was, if you want to work it out, 75 head of cattle. And, uh, okay? and, and, and so he changed the direction. Restaurants began to open around him. People began to build around him. We built Metro Hall. There was a hotel down the street. And then people began to build condos around him. And then TIFF was built our most recent neighbor. And so the, what had once been an industrial area turned into a residential neighborhood. And really, a lot of credit should go to Barbara Hall in 2002, 
who said these don't have to be light industrial buildings anymore. You know, when we had the restaurants, the city came to us and said, tear down the top three floors over them. You can't have workers above what might set a fire in a wood building. And so, you know, he emptied those buildings and kept them empty till 2002. In the last 10 years, we converted them and we now have them as places where there are companies like my own, which deals with tickets and deals with theater, and companies that deal with ideas about water and all sorts of interesting activities that those buildings have been able to provide jobs for. But what he really did is from 63 to 2013 is he brought it back into the public realm. So today, where the discussion is, is do we keep the remnants of the public realm? And this is the crux of my discussion with city planning, who are saying these warehouse buildings are more important than Frank Gehry. And I'm saying, no, what's important is to, we've now got all these people coming into the neighborhood, and there's traffic on the sidewalk, but the sidewalks are narrow because warehouses don't want that. They build right to the street line. Let's pull back from the street line. Let's pull back from the corners. Let people have room to move. We're going to keep the Royal Alexandra Theater. We'll, we have TIFF on the other side. But if we want John Street to be a cultural corridor and link the Art Gallery of Ontario to the aquarium and have activity on John Street, you can't have them all coming to the Princess of Wales on John Street and parking going through that building. So David, on John. let's show some pictures so people can see exactly what you're talking about. And, and let me just say ahead of time that the model of development in Toronto has been, as I'm sure you know, uh, the idea of the tower on the podium. It wasn't always that way, but it has been for the last 15, 20 years, whatever. And the idea, the principle here is that you, you activate the street level, you have shops, stores, restaurants, so on and so forth. So you maintain that street wall, you maintain that street activity, and that you put the towers on top of that podium. And the towers that we prefer now in Toronto tend to be tall, thin towers. So height, height is a big part of it. And I'm, we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, but the city has raised a number of, of, of objections to, to this project, um, <clears throat> none of them which, of course, are valid, uh, I would argue. Um, <coughs> David, of course, is much too polite to say that, but, but I'm not. Um, so what we're looking at here is the, the ground level um, of, of the project. And David, maybe you can go into a bit more detail what we're seeing here. Yes, you have to understand how Frank Gehry works. Uh, we, we started out with the first images that we showed the public a year ago, because we are now a year, and Frank was 83, and he's now 84, and I'd like to point this out because, you know, all he's, he wants to come home. He wants to do a great building in Canada, but he also doesn't want to spin his wheels because he has only so much time to do so many buildings, and he has extraordinary buildings going on everywhere in the world at the moment. Uh, but when I said, let's give up on, on, on evoking warehouse, he said, no, no, I'm going to use wooden beams and glass and bring it to the front of the building, but I'm going to bring the building line back. So you're looking at the northeast corner of John and King on the left-hand side here, and the entrance into the stores, because there will be about six floors of activity in the lower parts of these buildings that are inviting to the public, where we want the public to come and go. But unlike the Princess of Wales, which brings them all in at one time of the day and crowds everything at once, that same traffic will now get spread out through the day and be absorbed in another way. And then he's taken these romantic, I think romantic, because I think a curve is always romantic, uh, <laughs> it, uh, shapes and protected people from the street with these canopies that I think evoke a hundred years earlier in Paris and Guimard are the references for me. The sense of, of the curvaceousness that Art uh, Nouveau was able to express in that moment Let, and that made just, that city so distinguished. Let's just talk, uh, explain a little bit more. Um, in the first version, um, the city felt that, um, that uh, that these uh, old warehouses were gone, 
um, and that they were uh, a heritage element in the city worth saving and normally of course one would agree with that. And so their request was that Frank Geary try to reflect in, in, in his architecture this industrial heritage. And it's hard to see on this slide here, but there are a number of, of thick, heavy wooden beams that are meant to evoke uh, this uh, history, this particular element of, of the history of, of uh, King Street. And the, the parts that you see coming down, the, the Guimard elements that David's talking about, are glass. There is um, sort of essentially a, a rectangular building behind them. These glass elements come down. They're sort of not fully opaque, not entirely transparent, but kind of a, a milky sort of glass that would let in light. Um, but as David says, that they would provide a sort of a protective element. Should we go to the next slide? Yes, I think that would be helpful. Now you can see a little closer and see the wood, the wooden beams on the various floors. And this is one of the corners. And so it's a mix of stores. It's a mix of university. Uh, OCAD University is going to be a part of this. Uh, it's a mix of art uh, gallery. Uh, I've spent 50 years of my life collecting visual art. And we will put the core of that collection into 60,000 square feet of it. That will have to be backed up with about 100,000 square feet of warehouse space out of the city in order to feed it. Uh, and people don't quite understand what those interrelations mean. Uh, I've spent some time the other day with some of the senior teachers at OCAD, and we were talking, because they're looking at putting uh, curatorial studies and fine art history into this location. And as they began to look at my collection, they could see that they had a tool that they could work with which would give them some differentiation from what other universities were capable of doing because of the access to certain material. Uh, I look forward to that. I went recently to the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in uh, uh, Venice and spoke with Philip Rylands, who has run that institution now for 33 years. And he said, we have 1,500 interns that apply for 30 positions. And they come for three months to live here. They all have BAs. They're working on MAs or PhDs. And they go off later. And they're all either in philosophy or fine art history or uh, architecture. And then they go off and they talk about our museum. And in fact, Sam Mendes is coming to visit me next week. And Sam did American Beauty, the film. He was an intern. And much of the imagery there comes from the Magritte in that collection. So, a lot of inspiration, a lot of dialogue. It's a way of connecting Toronto to the University of Tokyo. It's a way of connecting us to a university in Prague. It's a way of having a dialogue between cities. So you have to understand that, that the nature of the jobs are complex as to what's going to go on in this building. At the same time, I'd love it if Rem Koolhouse would put United Nude in who makes computer shoes for ladies. It's a, such an extraordinary and unique store. And why wouldn't we have an extraordinary little cheese store? And why wouldn't we have a great bookstore? Why wouldn't we have it? So the, the elements of what make this a community, this is a place to live. We live in a city where most of the cities of Canada are symbolized by our bank towers. They dominate our downtowns. And Maybe where we live is as important. And maybe where we live should rise to the same height and have the same presence. So on one side, we have a lot of wonderful institutions. They've been very successful at what we, they do. If their employees wanted to live near them and be able to walk to work in 10 minutes, wouldn't that be a wonderful juxtaposition? And wouldn't it be wonderful to say to the world that living and how we live and where we play and what we do is as important as how we make our livings. So that's part of the story of what we're trying to express in the height, in the three towers, in the balance uh, of what's going on here. Well, you know, we're going to talk about the towers in a second, but the podium, the six, seven-story podium is where is the public part of this project. 
And I think that if you think about the typical form that development takes in Toronto, you know, you have a dry cleaner, a sushi, uh, and maybe a Tim Hortons at ground level. Um, and the people, you know, the people who live and build these condos are happy to have these uh, tenants in their building. Um, and I think that the point here is that you, know, you have TIFF on one side, you have the Royal Alex, you have the addition of OCAD University and an art gallery, uh, these teaching uh, facilities, uh, and the idea of the John Street Corridor, which has been around for maybe three or four years and hasn't really gone anywhere yet, but still could. And you create a kind of a critical mass here. Uh, and of course, then there's the building itself. And, and the building itself um, is sculpture. And Frank Geary has always been very upfront about the fact that he is, he sees himself at least as much a, a, as a sculptor as he does an architect. Uh, and I think that this, this would be unique in Toronto. And, and with the John Street Corridor, it would tie the whole thing together all the way up from Dundas at the AGO right down to the lakefront. More pictures of the, uh, of the podium here. You can see the, the wooden beams that, that David has talked about. There also is an echo of the Italian Galleria in the Art Gallery of Ontario with this, so that it links the neighborhood. It actually speaks to that. And, and Frank lived on Beverly Street. His, his grandmother was there. And uh, so he wants to use clay and brick also in the buildings and in the tower. And we're exploring different materials. Where we'll end, we're not sure. This, this, this is how Frank makes a drawing. He builds models. He told me there would be 75 models before we're done. We're somewhere around model 45. The volumes and shapes are there, but you know, this, is, this is part of the great adventure. So it doesn't fit into the normal box. It doesn't fit into the way people usually work, and you have to give enough room for creativity. But I'm used to buying an uh, art that hasn't quite been finished or isn't quite dry yet. So this is just another piece of that. This is the... Uh, That's the street uh, uh, Ed Mervish Way, which is so, sometimes called Duncan Street. <laughs> you know, I think it's uh, interesting to talk about uh, Frank Geary for a second because um, he, he left uh, the city when he was 17 or 18 in the late 1940s. But it's always been very important to him uh, to be Canadian. In fact, he is a dual citizen. And if you look at the textbooks, He's always described as a Canadian-American architect. Um, and if you go to his office, you'll see that he, his walls are, are covered in, in hockey uh, paraphernalia. Uh, he's a big hockey fan. <clears throat> so the Canadian element, uh, the Canadianness of Frank Geary is something that is easy to forget because everybody thinks of him as being American. But for him, this is an important thing. And it also kind of it would be the culmination of a career that has lasted a long time. And I mean, I know that you go, you, you met uh, Frank Geary um, I, before he was famous. I, I, I had an art gallery in Toronto from 1963 to uh, 78. And in 1971, I showed a Californian artist uh, named uh, Ron Davis. And he had just had his studio and house built by a, a younger architect named Frank Geary. I did a dinner for Ron, and they both came, and that was the first time I met Frank. And I stayed in touch over the years, off and on, but Frank uh, really didn't become, gain attention till I think about 76 with his own house, and then real worldwide attention until Bill Bow. Uh -huh. But uh, um, it, it's all, the thing that people sometimes don't quite understand, because I've gone for the grand gesture, I've gone to say Toronto matters as a city and we should stand up and we should be seen and be willing to take a place amongst other great cities. But Frank, in the intimacy of what he does, is very responsive. And uh, the first drawings of the art gallery, I had some quel qualms about and uh, qualms and, and uh, uh, I didn't even have to announce them. He could get it from uh, one or two sentences in body language and came back with a much more responsive and 
program that f fitted what I wanted. And then he came back again with something. So it, he's v very much textural. He fits into context. He's very much aware of where these buildings are going and what their relationship is to all the rest of the buildings around him. His models are not built in isolation. They're built with whole city blocks built out around them so that he can see where these are going to fit in and what's coming up. And uh, you know, we've looked at, at, tried to fit within new city guidelines about spacing. And the old city guidelines were 18 meters between towers. Uh, the new ones are 25. We're very close to fitting exactly those 25. So he's, for all that what he's doing, he's very thoughtful about, about what the needs of a community are. He doesn't want to build a building that isn't going to succeed. He wants to build a building that with 30 years after, we won't know how good it is the day he builds it. We only know now with hindsight how great the TD Bank building is. Uh, and maybe someday if we build at the best level we possibly can, maybe we can challenge that with a new building downtown. That's the game. That's the, the goal. But you know, this is an important point the, the, the Frank, about Frank Geary's sensitivity to context. Uh, if you go, for example, even to the AGO and you go to the Gallery Italia, it, it, as much as anything, it is a viewing stand from which you can see the city spread out to the north in front of you. And I remember talking to him when the gallery was opening, and he was very um, proud of that fact. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a coincidence. It didn't just happen. And even, the, even a building like the Guggenheim in Bilbao makes all kinds of very urbanistic gestures. And, and I think that we tend to get sort of carried away with the spectacle of his architecture. Um, but he's actually very sensitive to, the, to context. And, and as I say, the, the Guggenheim connects the river to the city. It even opens up to allow transit to move through. And that's, I think, he takes great delight in doing that. And, and this project, uh, one of the reasons I think it's so important is because it's about the public realm. It's not just um, another developer trying to make as much money as possible, selling as many condos as possible. That's not what this is about, although it's the condos that make it economically possible. Well, this is Chris, you know, the, one of the things that, that Frank has done is the Room for Lauren Harris. There's no flourish in the Room for Lauren Harris. It has personality, but it's perfect for those pictures. So at one moment, you have a, a place that opens out that's flam flamboyant and welcomes you in the entrance way. And then when it's time to show the pictures, Frank pulls back and lets you see what it is that you're look you've come for. You know, that, that's why I, I chose him. Another view uh, from, from the street level. This is looking west, I think. I th yes, I think it's really important that we have retailing in this neighborhood. We have three very high-end hotels. Uh, the Trump, the Shangri-La, and the Ritz-Carlton, and yet there is no shopping uh, that really holds people in the neighborhood. They all have to go to Young and Bloor, to Yorkdale. Great cities usually have two or three areas where these activities take place, and I think that there's a role on the ground level and on the second floor that that's important to play, where we can have anchor tenants in the corners. And, and uh, in addition to that, it's how many meters from a subway station? So close. And then, then there's the King Streetcar, soon to be replaced, of course, by a brand new 21st century LRT, and at some point in the future, closed off to cars. So the concern, or, or so we hope. Uh, we're don't working hold on your it. breath. Don't hold your breath, but we're working on it. But it, it will happen. And, and, and this is the building that anticipates Toronto's future. And when it finally arrives, it will be sitting there, ready, willing, and able. Let's look at the towers now. David, why don't you start this? Well, I, I, Frank was faced with the conundrum that usually you have a base and a tower. And he wanted to unite them. And in a way, he's created three vases. They, uh, one of iron uh, tower, a glass tower, and a clay tower. Um, but they're really, really like three flowers growing out of a vase. Now, I'm being metaphorical, and uh, I hope you don't expect me to water them. Uh, but, 
But I just think that uh, this, this material he has used before on the west side of Manhattan in a building he did there. Uh, it worked very beautifully, and he thought, I can make it even more interesting. I can use a milkier glass that you'll be able to see through at night, and it will be opaque in the daytime. So we're playing. We're playing with materials. As I say, the, the, you know, we may not be able to afford this much architecture, but part of the height and part of the density has to do with being able to pay for architecture and also to be able to pay for an art museum. Most people never can do an art museum because how do you sustain it? And we'd like to not have to charge the public. We'd like to maybe have to charge for special exhibitions, but we'd like to have it funded to the level that we can have the public in, and, and that's where the rents of the commercial space t plays a role. So all of that you know, comes together in different elements. So we only have a few minutes left, but why don't you tell us exactly where the project is in the, in the, in the approval process? Well, the latest information that I have on it is we've been in dialogue a full year now, and there is a made in Toronto solution that we are often confronted with, and the made in Toronto solution is fit in with what exists. Uh, don't put your head up too high, don't stick out. And so if we would like to do one tower next to the Royal Alex and maybe one tower between two of the warehouse buildings and therefore eliminate the public realm from the corners and not make the sidewalks wider, I suspect we could get permission. I think that's where we're at. So when will you be at the OMB? <laughs> Uh, in January. In January. So that's when we'll find out what happens. I think, David, we've run out of time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Gordon McIver to thank our guests. Thank you, Noble, Mr. Mervish, Mr. Hume, colleagues and members of the Empire Club of Canada, ladies and gentlemen. The rise of certain Canadian families to the status of icon is not as common an occurrence in our country as it is to our neighbours to the south or in certain European or Asian nations. In recent years, however, it's been very interesting. There's been the phenomenon where we've seen certain dynasties emerge here at home, whether it's with the McCains in New Brunswick or the Desmarais in Montreal, the Westons here in Toronto. It's especially interesting for us at the Empire Club to watch the ebb and flow of these families and at times to welcome one generation after another to our podium, as our president referenced earlier. And such, of course, is the story of the Mervish family, whose name has become synonymous across Canada and in many great cities around the world with innovative retailing, extraordinary theatre, original contemporary art and design, and now truly world-class architecture, real estate development, and indeed city building. Now our president referenced the two speeches that David, your father, made to the Empire Club, and uh, he could have mentioned that in the second, uh, your father went on at some length about what you were doing during that period, and the work you were doing in theater, and he glowed with the pride of a father that knows that his son is gonna go on to do great things. When David opened his contemporary art gallery in 1963, right around the corner from his father's very famous retail store, he had the support of that father, even if Mr. Mervish Sr. did not particularly share his son's love of contemporary art. He must have marveled all the same at how David evolved into a world-class champion of the contemporary style and later continued to grow and to flourish as the most successful theater operator that this country has ever known. Now in 2013, David Mervish continues to grow and to dream, as we've seen today, and will soon bring to our fair city what may well be one of the most important architectural and real estate projects of our generation. The Mervish plus Gary Pro Toronto project is already receiving acclaim from around the world and could well be the most important project in David's life. And so the family dynasty with its icons has led us today to look forward to an incredible new addition to our fair city. Uh, right up there with, as our president referenced, the CN Tower, the AGO, and the ROM. 
David knows that his family, his city, and his community have given him that place in history. To quote him, I, have, I had the chance to stand on my father's shoulders. I didn't do it myself in one generation. I did it because I worked alongside him for 50 years. So thank you to Christopher Hume for the fine job he did today in bringing out some of the rich fabric that makes up David Mervish and this project. And thank you, David, on behalf of the Empire Club of Canada for coming here today and reminding us that there are great icons in Canada, both buildings and humans, and that you and your family have attained that status in both categories. Thank you. And as a token of our appreciation on behalf of the club, uh, both you, Mr. Hume, and Ms. Mr. Mervish, we'll, we'll get you a copy of this book. It's Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes, a selection of 100 years of Empire Club speeches. Uh, I'd like to just uh, mention that all of you have at your table a list of our upcoming events. We have uh, Tim Lewicki, President and CEO of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, on October 29th at the Arcadian Court. And we have Ms. Linda Hasenfratt, CEO of Linamar Corporation on November 5th at the Royal York Hotel. I'd like to thank American Express for sponsoring our lunch this afternoon. Your support is very appreciated. I'd like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor. I thank you to Van Valkenburg for providing our AV. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV and we are grateful for your ongoing support as well. We're on Twitter and on Facebook, and we have our own web website where you can get more information on membership. It's empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned.